Here we go. We are up to 76 people tonight, so let's get this thing started. Um, All right, why don't we uh, maybe start with Lauren? She's got a 2 a.m. Uh, wake up time, so she wants to see maybe she can cut out early. So I was hoping that that you would talk about um, uh, maximizing honey production with swarm management and things like hog, uh, you know, the hog half comb. Um, I know a few years ago, I don't know if Kavita's on, but a few years ago, she did that so successfully. So um, if you would talk a little about that, I'd really appreciate it. I'm not sure. I don't know if Kavita is on. Is she on? Yeah, she's on. Kavita, why, can you, do you want to um, chime in and, and tell us what you did? Uh, yes, sure, I can do that. Okay, great. I did this only once in 2021 and I had success with it. So I don't know if I was lucky or, you know, I did a good management, but anyway, this was how I did it. Uh, I use all mediums, by the way, and I mm -hmm. use the hog half uh, cassette. Um, what I, I looked at uh, all my, yeah, I looked at my hives and I chose the strongest hive that I had, which had overwintered. And I decided to reduce the brood boxes in that hive. So what I did is I went in with three brood boxes. I took out one of the brood bo boxes. I reduced it so that then the bees were overcrowded. So I was trying to give them very little space. With the box that I took off, I put it in another part of my apiary mm -hmm. and I put the queen in there with all uncapped brood, um, a lot of honey and pollen stores so that then she could, um, and a lot of nice bees as well to take care of the open brood. Because I know at that point that the foragers will not be going to that hive. So the population will reduce after a while there. And then with my original hive with the two brood boxes, uh, which was queenless by now, uh, and, and I left one frame of eggs and uh, uh, just a few, some pollen and some honey in there. But basically these bees, the bees in there would have all the field force coming in, but there is no brood for them to take care of because all the brood is capped. So my thinking was that then all they have to do is just go up into the hog half cassette that I've put in there and start drawing uh, wax. And because there is no open brood there, they don't need much pollen. Basically, they don't have to uh, go out and look for pollen, but instead just bring in a lot of honey in there and start filling those boxes. But what I found was that um, a few days after I did that, the bees started to uh, make a queen because they were overcrowded. Uh, there was no queen there. They started doing superstitious cells. So uh, every three or five days, I had to go in there and destroy all the cells because I didn't want them to swarm. That would defeat the whole purpose of having uh, the field force there. Um, and, and it did work. That's, well, that's Peter, how long do you think you could do that before you risk a laying worker? Well, I would go in there and every few days put in a, another uh, frame of egg. Oh, 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 wow. That's so good. All right. Um, you can do, yeah. So you can keep them from, from becoming laying workers in a couple of ways. Once you could put in a synthetic queen pheromone also. All right, so you can purchase a synthetic queen from Now, what Kavita is explaining is the classic way to make comb honey. Reduce your resources. Are you done, Kavita? Uh, yes, yes, I am. You sure? You sure? You're not going to tell us about your, your, your eating all of that wonderful comb honey? Or did you give them up? It was incredible honey. It was very white. It was right at the beginning. And, and also that has to be done right when there is a very strong nectar flow. That's it. So, so, so it she hit all of the strong points of making honey. Make certain that the colony doesn't swarm. If the colony swarms on you, it will, you will, your honey production will be reduced or totally eliminated for that year. So you can't let whatever hive that you structure for this 
honey rearing piece of it, comb honey. We're talking about comb honey right now. We'll talk about regular honey, but the same principles apply actually. You have to make certain that it doesn't swarm. And you have to start with the way Kavita started. She, she said she looked for um, a strong colony that overwintered very strong. So she start, you got to start with a good, strong base. And then you start your, <clears throat> your preparations. And what she did was she moved her um, brood. Now, what you, what, you, what, you should, what you can do in those cases, she, she moved that box over to some other part of her apiary. That was her, that was her first sort of manipulation. And she made the, the she, you had two boxes that you left for your honey production, right? Yes. Yeah, you could do that with one if you wanted to. You could leave one box and overpack that. Comb honey producers, since they don't want to invest in two boxes or use two boxes or have to manipulate two boxes, they'll stuff all of their bees down into one box. But even that's not necessary if you, um, uh, if you hit it right. So, uh, so she did some very key manipulations, picked a great colony, moved the queen out of it, and gave the bees something to do because they basically didn't have anything to do. Now they had a large field force, which came back to that colony from the box she moved, plus the field force that was already there in those two boxes that she had. Um, so she has a big field force and nothing for the nurse bees to do. And um, then she put her um, hog frames on top of that colony. Did you use a queen excluder? You didn't have to. Yes, I did. I yeah. did. I, I just didn't want to take the chance of them going there with pollen. Oh, well, no, that's not what I meant. Uh, in case there was a queen in there and I it, had... It, yeah, yes. Or or virgin queen flies back in. You know, that, that could happen, you know, from right. another flight, um, another place. You could actually put a queen excluder on the bottom of those boxes if you want to prevent a... You know, because you're in, you're, you're, you're approaching swarm season when you're doing all of this, and there's lots of queens flying around, and one can inadvertently fly into that colony. So you want to make sure that it doesn't get queen right if that's your goal. Now, um, the other, other uh, thing that um, you could do in that case, Lauren, we talked about this once a long, long time ago, and you questioned me about it. So maybe you'll remember that I said that you can actually increase honey production in that situation if you put an upper entrance in near under your under or over the top of your your um hog rounds and and the reason is for that um your bees that are bees are always going to be foraging for pollen no matter what you know in lower they'll learn to come back and they won't come in the upper entrance normally they'll find the lower entrance and go in that and the upper entrance will be foragers that are going to offload their nectar quickly now, a colony will adjust that way and you'll get more um, honey production because there's a shorter trip uh, for the bees to um, uh, put nectar in those cells, in the hog cells, and then evaporate. And so, so, that's so is that above or below? It doesn't matter as long as they have uh, access to the to the uh, box. Huh. I would if you put it below, you're gonna have to put a shim in there, and that would that would get you some burr comb. So if you put it above with a shim, you'll probably be better off. Like a, like right, like right. like putting a inner cover on that has a hole in it, you know, for yeah. an entrance in the front. Yeah, I don't have yeah, any. That's what I thought you meant yeah, when you said I mean. an upper entrance. Yeah, you put you flip it upside down so that it's uh, so the hole will allow bees to go in and out. Yeah, Actually, watch I think it. my thought was that if I did that, the bees would have um, their feet would be filled with pollen. So would that not leave traces of? pollen and dirty the comb because I want the wax cappings to be very white. So I- You know, I, where it, takes, it takes a while for that to happen. So that doesn't happen right away. And, and as soon as they draw comb out in that little round or rust round or the hog uh, frame, then they, uh, they, start, they start to fill it with nectar. Once it's capped, they leave that comb. They're not walking around on it, so. You know, they go to the next place they can lay. So, yeah, you don't you don't have to do that. I'm just saying that's an option that 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 uh, honey produce uh, comb honey producers usually put an upper entrance in for that reason. Right. So, um, thank you very much. 
that's the basic scenario. But now there's a couple of key observational points in that. Number one is I have to know my colony strength going into this. And then the other thing is to manage the flow, right? So you have to know it has to ha it won't occur. They won't build wax unless there's no space for them in the bottom box to build. And that, that was the case with Cavitas. And how long did it take them, by the way, to build your frames out, draw the comb out in the Ross Reynolds? On the, were you using Ross at that time or Hogs? Hogs. Uh, cassettes and my um the total time it took for them to fill it up draw out fill it up and cap was um may to june one month yeah four weeks and you got all that luxurious honey learn now so um <laughs> but you could did you think about putting another box on after that uh while that was on there like under it like nader it I, I did I didn't have any additional box. Okay, so you may have been able to put another box under that. It's called NATO. But another box, do you mean a regular another round box? Another, yes, another, another round. Yeah, if the flow is really strong, yeah, you can put another box under this with with cassettes and see if they draw it out. You know, there's Thank nothing bad much. to have that. If that comb is drawn out, then you can use it again too, right? You can put it back and let them fill it and then for the second season. Mm -hmm. You know, if you needed to, so you know, it's just like drawing any other kind of drawn comb. It's valuable for to you, except you're giving it. You're you're going to give it away with the with the sale of that box. It's so. artisanal. You're putting a high ticket on it because it's artisanal. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Since it's artisanal, it's artisanal. <laughs> right. Exactly. Thank you very very much, both of you. All right. So the Thank same. You. Okay. Uh, now during that discussion, uh, Dean was putting up. Uh, photographs in the chat. You saw um, what we were talking about. You'll and keep a, keep and pay attention to that because when we discuss things tonight, um, um, if if, uh, if Dean thinks uh, it's worth a, a photo or something or an extra explanation or a link or something, he'll put it up there. So um, he, he um, that's a great service for us, and uh, so take advantage of it. If I could chime in a little bit on that comb honey production, yes, please. Um, I I do quite a bit of it myself, and I've been playing around with a couple different methods. One thing you want to think about in um, the Connecticut River Valley, where I keep bees, um, our honey flow is really short, May, essentially May and June, where it's all yeah. done by July 4th. So if you're thinking, hey, I want to make comb honey, you know, the middle of June, your window is kind of already closed. Yeah. And I've been kind of experimenting with a new technique I've kind of come up with for making comb honey. And essentially, I do my first round of split or my first round of supering second week of May, first week of May. And then when I go around my, uh, for my second round of supering, I'm keeping an eye out for the top 15% of my colonies, colonies where the bees are in the honey supers, not necessarily, they don't necessarily have to be drawn out everything, but I want them to see, I want to see that they're in the honey supers. Working. Yes. Um, and, um, and at that point, if they're there and, okay, I want to make this a comb honey production colony and I see the weather's good in the next week or so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the queen. I'm going to put the queen in the bottom box. I'm going to move down six to eight frames of brood and have a queen excluder. That second deep, uh, I'm going to take off to the side for right now. And since I already spoke about, you know, I'd already did first round of supering. So this is technically second round of supering. I leave my first super that I put on right on top of that, that um, single. And then mm -hmm. I'll add my comb honey, or excuse me, I will put my comb honey box on. And then I'll put the, the first round of super, super the, uh, that I put on previously on top of that. Then I'll use a double screen division board, put it on, put it on top of that honey super. So currently you have your um, palette or your bottom board, your deep with the queen in it, queen yeah. excluder, comb honey or Ross round or yeah. hog or whichever yeah. product you want to use. Then your queen, then your, um, then your uh, honey super. And then you got a double screen division board. And then you put your second deep on top and your cover. Right. And most of those bees, now you didn't shake any bees out of that second um, deep box. Most of them will fly out and go in the bottom. So you're essentially reducing the volume uh, of the area that the bees can lay eggs, but you're maintaining the same volume of the beehive uh, where the for original colony was um, occupying. And in doing so, 
they're um well let me back up one second i did not initially super with a queen honey or the a queen excluder and in best case scenario i have the um the queen laying a little bit in the queen excluder or in the um in the honey super and so it's going to force the bees to go through that queen excluder and try to keep that brood warm and in the same time they're half they're forced to work and sit on that um, comb honey super and they will draw it out um but going back to that top the second deep which i put on top of the double screen division board i usually leave like two or three frames of brood in there and a couple frames of honey they'll by the time you're done with the season, it's essentially a split. They'll raise their own queen over 75% of the case. And you can either put it somewhere where you have a dead out or recombine it at the end of the season. Um, but I have really good success with this. And last year we made 4,500 pieces of comb honey. Oh, very nice. I mean, that's a that's a great way to do it. It's the same as a Demary split. You know, it's a classic split where you put the top uh, box, you know, over the top of the double screen. Now you fly them out of the back bill or the front, that top box? It doesn't make a difference because because all the bees that previously left are going to leave. Yeah, and, no. I'm uh, when you when you're flying, what I have done. Yeah, when you what do you fly the, the top box out of the back? Oh, okay. just out, out of the front because I'm on pallets. So okay, so you to have to fly out of the front. The, okay. Yeah, they got to so, go out of yeah. the front, but most of them I just recombine them at the end and just hey, yeah. I've got a queen. may the strongest queen win. Yeah, <laughs> well, well, that's what I well, that's what I do too. I'll, I'll recombine them when it, that's a lot of manipulation and. Um, you know, if you got help and labor, that's a great way to do it, and uh, uh, it, and it gets you that second queen. It doesn't, it doesn't increase your footprint. You got a new, a nice young queen going in, and like you said, you take that queen excluder out after the flow, and put them back together, and there you go. You know, you got a, you got a, you got a, a dual a fitness contest, and then made the made the strongest queen win. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah, so maybe Bill, you can come down to our bee yard at some point and demonstrate that whole technique for us. Would you be willing Anytime, to- Anytime, just let me know. All right, sure, we will. Um, uh, and um, so that's, an, that's again, you know, I put some, when I was um, really concerned about really high honey production, what I would do is I would put uh, two or three supers in the middle of that, um, of that bottom box and, and uh, try to keep that from, try to keep the bottom box from swarming because you know if you have a really good season that that bottom box will build again and they'll swarm out of it you know so it's it's really interesting all right so there's another perspective so see we got we've got folks that can really do that here make lots of comb honey all right so let's get started with some questions well let me back up a little bit you know we do we are seeing um you know welcome to b talks <laughs> and um i'm bill hesbeck i'm the president of um the uh, Connecticut Beekeepers Association. And we usually start this with a bloom calendar. Lots of people are seeing pollen coming in. Um, so uh, I, you, you can possibly see pollen coming in for a number of reasons or, or from a number of plants, right? One of them at this point is skunk cabbage in some areas. Now, um, the, the way plants bloom is a science and it's called phenology. And that all has to do with the amount of degree days that uh, occur, and those are um, measured uh, by the amount of um, heat the sun pr produces in any given day, the temperature, air temperature. And uh, plants respond to that and they bloom in that way. So what I, the reason I'm even suggesting that you want to know a little bit about that is because it's, it's regional, right? So even though my silver maples this year didn't bloom, I don't think, possibly some of yours did you know, uh, and you got some uh, nectar and pollen out of those, but you could get, you can be seeing alder pollen coming in at this point, skunk cabbage. It's possible in some areas of the state that you're seeing uh, pussy willow that's out, um, has, um, there are a number of little interesting patches of uh, yellow blooms that come out that bees will roll around in, but they don't actually, it's not enough forage for the whole colony, but you'll have these little patches in people's garden um, that will come up. So uh, has anybody seen anything else blooming out there that will explain this pollen coming in? I know we had some questions about seeing yellow pollen. Now, um, I mentioned earlier before we started that, um, that um, bees are flying, bees will fly really 
in low temperatures in the springtime. So my bees, if it's a windless day, they were so accustomed to forging in that false spring we had that they were out at 38, 39 degrees forging and bringing back pollen. As long as the wind wasn't out, the March sun's angle keeps them warm as they fly and they can go light on something, collect the pollen and come back and uh, be perfectly safe. Now you won't see that later on in the season. As it, as it gets warmer, bees will spend more time in the colony in the morning until it warms up before they fly out. But in the spring, when they're desperate to be brood, because I'm sure they brood it up. Bill, what, what are you like at this point? You got a lot of brood in those colonies? You looking at them? Uh, about 1,200 of my colonies are in California and the rest of them are here in Georgia. But they're brooding <laughs> up really nice. Yeah, I can tell you that. Yeah, those, are, yeah. those are doing really well. And in the first major honey flow of the year right now. Yeah, okay. All right, so. Mm. Okay, so um, so that's that's that explains a little bit about what you're um, why you're seeing some uh, pollen come in right now because you might think, hey, there's nothing out. You look around, um, but bees are extraordinary at um, early pollen sources. They know where they are, um, and they go after them every year. Um, I know I have next to me. I have uh, literally uh, thousands and thousands of uh, skunk cabbage in the low areas that surround my area, my house. And uh, I look for them every year, see when they bloom and and um, hike the trails that lead me to the wetlands that I can see bees or any kind of insect going on um, skunk cabbage, one of my favorite early plants to look at. All right, so what are some of the questions? Let's get going here. Anything else we should uh, be talking about before, um, Jose, before we uh, get started? Well, someone is asking uh, when they can do their first inspection. No, they, well, they can. They could have done their. They could do their first inspection anytime. Uh, you know, it it doesn't. Um, by inspection, what do they mean? Like go in and take the whole colony apart, looking for the queen and all that. I mean, so you that's not probably advisable, especially especially in the next couple of days when we get uh, a bunch of snow and cold weather. But um, any of those days when it was forty or fifty years old, fifty degrees, you could go in and take a look at your colony. You can actually. Pull a frame or two if you want, but re remember, like the the goal on early inspections is only to see if you have enough stores in that colony to continue to get through March. Because March is is if you don't pay special attention as a backyard beekeeper, especially pay special attention to the amount of stores you have in the colony right now, you can get in trouble because they 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 can starve out in March. So you have to make sure you have enough um, stores in there. So that that I would heft for, you know, and then hefting begins in the fall when you have um, examined your colonies for weight by just trying to lift them up. You have to make sure they're relatively flat and uh, so that you're getting a good indication of what that colony actually weighs. You can't have a fulcrum in there, like it leaning way forward and it'll feel real light even though it's heavy. You know, so um, the way the old timers used to do it, they would go to the back of the colony, heft it a little bit, then go to the front and heft it again, and then uh, get a get an idea of how much that colony weighed physically, you know, and then have a memory of that kind of, or make a note, and then and then you can follow the progress of bees eating honey during the winter time by continually hefting that hive at intervals. Of course, you know, it's a gentle process. Now you're not lifting the hive and banging it back down again but uh, you just get a feel for how much uh, food you have in it. That's one way I do it all the time. You know, let's just lift colonies and see how heavy they are. Now, um, you can also open the top cover and look inside. The, the end frames, my guess at this point, you'd allow four frames of honey in it still, even if it was, even if they were gross feeding on honey all year and you started with um, six or eight frames of honey in the top box, uh, they'll still have a couple on the side at this point because it hasn't been a, it's been an ideal uh, winter for uh, wintering, especially when you get those 40 degree temperatures, which are the, is the temperature that uh, bees don't use a whole lot of food at. And um, they don't fly a lot and they don't, well, during the winter, they don't fly a lot and they, um, they uh, don't consume a lot of resources uh, because they don't need to heat the colony as, as warm, as warmly, or they don't as much to maintain heat. So, um, so I'm, I'm guessing that 
um, you guys came through with some good stores or your colonies died, you know, from something else at this point. But anyway. So we have, so we have Matt with a question and then uh, there's a question about nuke. So Matt, go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. And I, um, I'm completely new to all this and uh, I don't have any hives yet, but I want to get um, two hives this year. And uh, I, I did the B school, which I thought was fantastic. So thank you so much for that resource. I thought it was great. Um, but my question is really very basic, which is I live in Hamden, Connecticut. I have about an acre and change. Um, and I'm just curious what it's like to live with a couple of beehives in my in my yard. In other words, are there I, I saw, you know, the flight path and, you know, the direction they take before they get up to a certain height and that kind of thing. But like, what should I expect when I put hives in my yard? Are there bees sort of everywhere, all over the place? Are they are they not noticeable, noticeable? Are they, you know, just is, is can anybody speak to sort of a sense of like what it's like to live with bees, I guess would be my my question. Um, yeah. so Matt. So who um, wants to answer that? I would love to so hear I that. I live in Hamden as well, Matt, and I live okay. in um by the, in the Legion Field neighborhood, a really uh like post World War II, it would never be zoned now. The yards are tiny, and yep. I have eight colonies. I can only really handle five on my own, but I have eight. And um, my very first year, I got bees, and I couldn't walk in my backyard. It was, it, I was like, this is not fun. I am like, these bees have a picture in their hive with my face on it saying. <laughs> It was so awful. I'm like, yeah, no, I'm not doing this. It's not fun. But I couldn't get rid of the hive without having the inspector come. And so I called Mark Crichton, the bee inspector, and he walked into my backyard and he's like, oh my God, is it always like this? I was like, yeah, this isn't fun. And he goes, you have a problem with the queen. He went to the experiment station in New Haven, came back with a new queen and problem solved. So if you have a really small yard, then even if you have a really, well, for me, if I have a really great queen, but the hive is hot, my yard will not tolerate that. It's too small. And I mm -hmm. usually will give the, that queen away to somebody who has a lot of space, so it doesn't matter. Um, so, you know, you're welcome to come see my yard. Um, it's, Thank you. It, it is, um, if they're everywhere and um, in a way that feels aggressive, then uh, something isn't going well. Okay. Right. So, but so so the, the experience, get some feedback. Somebody's mic is open. The only uh, day you should should really notice them flying quite a bit around your yard is the first day you install them while they're doing their orientation flights, or like the first day in the spring out of winter. Mm -hmm. Then you won't. Then if if all goes well, as Bill was saying, yeah, I mean that's a great time to see them too because they're not they're not aggressive and they're just learning about where the colony is. But after that, um, you know, you won't see them if they're not really a defensive colony. You won't see them at all. You won't notice them in your yard. I mean, the, the, the whole, well, you might notice bees in your yard, but they're not likely to be your honeybees unless there's an incredible dearth, then you'll see them. They come around mm -hmm. and, and they'll be flying around your windows or any place that they can scent that there's some, um, in my house, of course, if I open up the uh, back door and there's a dearth, the screen from the, you know, from the honey production piece of it in, or the consumption of honey in our house, you know, uh, bees will know that it's there and they'll fly around. So you won't, you won't, um, Lauren's experience is that she had a defensive colony that that uh, came out after her when she got close. And in that case, you have to just, you have to deal with that right away, Matt. So oh, can I jump in for a sec, sorry? Sure, go ahead, Dean. Um, so a couple of things, I'm on an acre. I have a child that was petrified of bees and now loves bees four years later. Um, the, the days when you have a backyard full of bees, it's your fault. <laughs> you, you, you effed up. <laughs> Normally there are no bees, but if I do something stupid, like- Oh, you know, okay, uh, I see what you're saying. And you're going to, you're absolutely going to. That's like yeah. these, these people are like, you know, they're talented beekeepers. You are gonna screw up. You're <laughs> gonna do something like, like leave some combs out and you're gonna like, you know- uh, Yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna cause Whip them into a frenzy. It's gonna happen. Yeah. It's going to be like, you know, three or four days a year, but you're going to be like, oh, I know why that happened. It was me. 
Yeah, you spill some, you spill a whole lot of, you know, the, the, the you know, when bees get really active and um, will go a little bit crazy is when, you know, there's a dearth on, which I'm sure you know what that is at this point, Matt, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when it's really not a big nectar flow out. And you might be doing something like thinking, well, I got to feed these bees. And you spill a bunch of syrup in the yard or you, you make some amateur mistake, like opening a bunch of colonies and start a bunch of robbing or even two colonies start a bunch of robbing. Then the bees will fly around your yard crazy until yeah. all of that calms down. You know, so. Um, thank you guys so much. And thanks for the comments there. I, I really yeah, no, appreciate so it. It's super helpful. Sign up with Jose awesome. for a mentor. You know what? Yeah, I, I, I actually do have a mentor and and who's been super helpful um in getting me sort of started on this um through the camera. through the camera. I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, Elizabeth came in the back door and is she... I was asking <laughs> so, so can I can sorry for the interruption. Um uh Bill and Jose, sorry for the interruption of people. Uh, coming into your offices right now, but we wanted to, I'm, I'm sorry for the timing. Um, we wanted to just all of us take a moment to thank oh. you so much for what you provide for us with BTOX. So um, I can't see Jose on my screen anymore, but Bill, I think Elizabeth just handed you something and Jose, did. Uh, stalker in your house, your mentee and neighbor. So um, <laughs> these are just our token of appreciation to both of you for um for being so gracious with your time and expertise and and hosting this every month so our sincere thanks oh thank you so much uh god um so uh can we can we open them up at a lot of time or should we open them up now i mean you i can I, open it up at another time you don't have to open it up now like there's great stuff here you know gift certificates there's something that smells better than i ever smell in, in here <laughs> Those so were just to wait the oh, must be some saying? soap those are just to weight the bag down. <laughs> There's other gift certificates for everything. So, you know, this is like so over the top generous of you guys. And I this really. Is, <clears throat> I can't even talk. I know. <laughs> I know. Well, you know, so um, and I've had I've had the um, pleasure of being able to do this for how many years now? I don't know. Three, maybe four. Oh, it's way more than that. It was before wow. the pandemic that we were in Middletown. Yeah, yeah, we were. Yeah, that's right. Wow. Oh my God. Yeah. We did it four or five years before, oh, no, three or four years before in Middletown, then all through the pandemic, we've been doing it on Zoom. Yeah. So. Well, our sincere thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. This was uh, unexpected, and um, I'm, I'm very grateful. Thank you. Yeah, so am I. I mean, you know, my, my gratitude, um, I hope it shows uh, with, with what we'll put into. We really um, enjoy doing this. You guys. So thank you so much. All right. On with the show. Where are we? Okay, uh, if I can get my head back in, in you can get it. if I can Matt, get my just, head back in the game. I was Matt, wondering what she to, was doing here. It's like, uh, you're not supposed to be here. What are you doing here? Yeah, great. It worked out. Uh, I'm, I'm busy. Uh, let's see. Uh, John yeah. is asking, if you feel the stores are low at this point in March, is it advisable to just add candy on the top of the frames on the top deep? Um, so if you, if you, uh, well, I don't, I don't particularly, um, uh, feed fondant or recommend fondant unless you're buying it from an, from a manufacturer that will, that converts that sugar enzymatically. But if there's heat in the process of making that fondant, like you're going to, and I think that's what they're talking about, right? Fondant. Well, they said candy. So, uh, I that's think usually, it's good to point out what you're talking about, but you know, also yeah. if you're talking about a sugar cake. Well, uh, a sugar cake is different than when people talk about candy, they're talking about fondant usually because then that's that's a you have to heat that mixture up to softball temperature and then it becomes fondant or candy. I don't recommend that at all. Sugar cake, yes, you can put it in now if you wanted to. You know, um, there's a recipe on our site for sugar cake. I think it's a good one. It takes nothing to make a sugar cake, and it is it is um, and you can put it on top of the top bars at this point, and let these um, feed it if they need it. <clears throat> um, you can actually also so since I run um, insulated top covers with really good insulation, I can get away with liquid feed this time of year. In a week, I can get a, I can get away with liquid feed because 
um, the, the insulation, insulated uh, telescoping cover goes over the top of that uh, top feeder. So I can fill that up. And during the daytime, uh, that gets nice and warm and these will come up and, and take syrup even um, in 40 or 50 degree days. So I can start feeding two to one, one to one at this point if I need to, but I don't need to. So um, it can be done. Now, if, you're, if you've got a lot of commercial colonies, um, we're going to let Bill talk about what he does for feeding. Um, uh, what's his, what are your, well, your, your bees are in California. What about the ones that are here, Bill? How are you feed, do you feed them out in the spring? I actually, all my colonies go down to my, well, in the county surrounding my farm down in Georgia in the winter time. Okay, right. okay, so you don't have but, any. But I use this, but being coming from roots from up there, I still use a lot of habits from New England down here that's really not used down here. So I like to have all my feeding of all my colonies done by October 15th. Yeah, yeah. well, that's the, that's, the, that's, the, that's the best situation, right? And the best thing to use is corn syrup if you're able to get your hands on it versus um, sucrose because sucrose stimulates bees even if it's one to one or two to one. It's a stimulating product versus uh, fructose. Um, but, but yeah, stimulate, but packing away as much food as you can by October 15th. Yeah. And that's when we essentially, I like to go on vacation after on October 15th, but that's the best thing I can do for feeding. This time of year, I would feed some thin liquid syrup. Um, the bees will take it if they want it um, on nice warm days that they'll, they'll work on it. Yeah, um, they'll work on it, right. Uh, so, but if they need it. Another thing to consider it, with it, it's just adding a little bit of bleach into it. Yeah. Um, and that will help prevent fermentation. Yeah. Um, so in our case, we, we don't really don't um, have to put bleach in them up here, but so, because we don't have the, uh, much heat and if, and, and I, I discourage people for leaving their, um, colony unattended long enough for, for that for the uh, fermentation to occur inside that thing so I try to discourage that um, uh, all right so let's move on so what else we got um, so we've got someone who's been patiently waiting for a question uh, should I treat my nuke with epi life epi guard or epi var strips when I move the nuke into the brood box um, well so the Nuke and they the, can't talk because their mic's not working. So oh, you're uh, still talking about get, all right. So let's see if we can figure out this question. So they're buying a nuke. Is that what you're getting out of it? Yeah. Yes. Is that you, Colleen? No, no it's no, someone named Admin. Okay, so they're buying they're buying a nuke. And they're I'm asking, doing the same thing. Yeah. And they're asking if they should treat it with uh treat that nuke when they put it into a into a box. Into the brood box, yeah. Um, immediately, in other words. Yep. Well, they won't be able to do that, I don't think, effectively at this point, because you know, you have um you have temperature requirements for, for those. Uh no, ape of our no temp, there's no temperature requirement for that. You could use that, but you gotta remember that that's uh we're we're seeing some resistance to that product at this point. And that's a neurotoxin. So um be careful about applying that to your colonies, and then we're getting mixed results on. On its role control at this point, some of the big producers out west are seeing it fail. Again, it had failed earlier when we used it in the, I think the eighties, um, and then it was, um, and then, then you know got away from it. And then it came back, and I I, I kind of wondered why it ever came back. But it's a big money maker, and if you stay away from it that that chemical long enough, you're going to get, um, um, you know, you, you'll, it'll become effective again just for a little while until they build up tolerance. So, I can chime in. Could I chime in a little bit on that? Sure, go ahead. So Ap Apivar is, uh, uses the active ingredient Amitraz versus Apistan, which was very common in the 90s. Um, um, was it Fluvalinate? Um, Apivar would be really your only choice if you're getting nukes in March or April. You got a 45 day treatment window on it. They should leave it in there for Pulling it out um, does expose the bees a little bit to um, resistance uh, because they're not getting the full two cycles of brood through it. Um, but the best thing you can do would be that. That's really your only option at that so point. Because yeah. Yeah. You know, the other, the other one has temperature. Yeah. And I the would other not one. be using the fluvalinate or the kumafos, just 
apivar if you want to use or anything, or you could do oxalic acid once every five days, even though it's not approved, four grams per, per box. Yeah, um, so those, those are, um, yeah. So that's a commercial beekeeper talking, you know? <laughs> so, so that's good, you know, we wouldn't, um, you know, so we would have to make certain that we stayed with the label, wouldn't we? On that two grams per box instead of four. Oh, of course, of course. Of course, we stay with the label on that. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, so Apovar would be your only treatment option. I'm not sure I'd do that right away, though. I mean, uh, on a nuke until I could figure out whether or not. Um, I think you got some time. You got, you've got with a nuke in our, in a normal year, you've got about eight weeks for it to build. And then um, uh, hopefully that nuke came out of a treated scenario. So in other words, when they made it, made up the, the person that made that nuke up is is uh is controlling for a role and you can ask them that you know whether or not that's they key them. yeah that that's really is key yeah and uh -huh. um, and then you wouldn't go on and treat them again right away you'd have to wait till they build a little bit and then do a roll and figure out what, what you have for varroa and then treat based on your observation of your uh, your role results all right jose go ahead yeah so uh Mike was cleaning out a dead out and the dead bees appeared to be missing either their whole head or part of their head. Any idea what happened? Yeah, I think that's a four letter word. Usually if they're missing their, their head or, or their head's gone, but their, uh, their body was there. Yeah. Their, their entire that's head correct. or part of their head. Yeah. That, that sounds like, um, that uh, didn't occur. Uh, that occurred last fall. And what usually happens is um, uh, bees, hornets, or yellow jackets, when they're looking for protein, they'll rip the head off of a bee and then fly back um, to the colony with the body. So usually you don't see the body, but lots of times if there's been a massive attack on that colony, you'll see some bodies left behind, you know, without heads. I mean, they rip, tear the heads off. That could be a, a European hornet. Uh, ball face hornets are known to do that, but basically yellow jackets do it also. You know, that's a way of, um, uh, that's, that's, that's what probably occurred there. If it, you can see it the other way, you know, you can see the, the uh, thorax missing on bees. Those are usually, that's usually a vole or some, um, some, uh, you know, some little creature like that that's going after the indirect flight muscles, which are having most protein for them. And so, and by the way, the um, yellow jackets and uh, European hornets and all that are also going back to feed brood with the body of the of the um, of the bee. You know, they got attacked and got killed. That's a tough way to go. Uh, if I could, Bill, I want to add something to that. If those are adult bees, I think that's that's likely all what's happening. I have seen a rare situation where if they're if they were still in the cell, so they're developed as adults, but never, I've never emerged as, as adults. There's some brood diseases which can give you bodies of adult bees on the bottom. Um, but I mean, if, if they're fully formed adults though, I, that's not the case. Yeah, um, so you're talking about uh, hygienic behavior where they pulled that. Yeah, cell yeah whether, whether it's some type of chalk brood or something, you can end up getting- Oh yeah, yeah. You get yeah. Your bees okay. that have no heads is what some new, new beekeepers notice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Be, I, I was I was assuming that the that the uh, quite that the uh, observation was that they were adult bees, but yeah, yeah they're fully as, formed adults. Yeah, as, as they're fully formed adults, though, you know, so um, you know they got predated somehow. Now, um, uh, what Walter's talking about is other brood diseases where there's some hygienic behavior involved, and they're pulling out if pulling out brood, and you're seeing it on the landing board or something like that, you know. So that's that's a different thing, and. Chalk brood, chalk brood comes out as mummies. There's little um, uh, hard sort of sacks that come out. Um, look up chalk brood and look for the signs. I haven't seen a lot of chalk brood around in a couple of years. I had, you know, four or five years back, I had um, quite a bit of it run through my yard in addition to um, bee paralysis viruses that, that also took out lots of colonies for me. So, but recently I've had a pretty clean run with, um, with that kind of stuff. So what else we got here, Jose? So yes, uh, Sean had to combine two hives and he went through the winter with each hive having three deeps. 
Yes. Both hives are thriving. Any suggestions on how to split them back into four hives? Well, um, there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, the, it, so he's got two hives with three boxes on each of them. I, I, I'm I wondering why he chose, Sean, if you want to speak up, uh, why you chose to overwinter with three deeps. Well, no, he just, he just combined them and it ended up with three deeps. That's what I got. Is that right? It was just the easiest thing that I could do at the time to keep them all in three deeps. And I felt that that way they would have adequate stores through the winter and it proved that they still have plenty of honey in there. So left them with three deeps. Yeah, so one of the, my guess is that that bottom deep at this point is empty. So there's probably not anything in that bottom deep that that's of any consequence. As a matter of fact, when, when I when I winter in two deeps, that bottom deep is is pretty much vacated of anything. Um, well, this time of year it might have something in it again, but um, you know, or begin to have something in it again. But but uh, late February that box is empty, and it might even be empty now. I don't know. There's not really much in it, so you could go through and start doing surgery on those boxes to get them back to two. But you can also do a number of other things. It's a little bit too early to do that manipulation now. You're gonna have to let them build the way they are right now and then and then work on those boxes. Um, uh, you you know, like it's too cold to do a walkaway split at this point. You know, we don't have queens available for you to requeen colonies. So there's lots of um, negative uh, things. To, once you get into that configuration, um, it's hard to winter over. It's It's hard to figure out that configuration in the springtime. It's not as easy to manipulate them. So you're going to have to wait a little bit longer until you find out every, you know, the conditions of each stack, whether or not they're, you know, are they queen right and where the brood is. And then you can do some, you'll screw that all up, try to do some surgery on it. It's not the easiest manipulation to do. Okay. Let's, let's talk about open feeding. Well, um, <clears throat> what kind of open feeding? Well, do you do any open feeding in your apiaries in the spring or do you feed the hives individually is the question. I feed, yeah, yeah. I don't think you should um, encourage, in, for backyard beekeepers, open feeding is probably not a good idea to do ever, you know, because um, there's lots of things that can occur. One is the transmission of viral diseases. We don't like that. If one, if one colony has a higher count of some kind of virus, like the farm wing virus, that's a communicable uh, disease. Also, uh, the paralysis viruses are very, very, um, the, the infectivity of those is from contact. So uh, that's not a good idea to. So the idea is, you know, you feed inside the colony. It's easy enough. You only have a couple. There's no reason to open feed. Um, you know, you're not talking about 1,500 colonies like Bill's running or 15,000. Oh, I forgot we said 15,000 or 1,500. <laughs> but uh, that's, you know, see, but you can put division board feeders inside the colonies, top feeders. Um, lot, just don't put in jars in the front with boardman feeders and you should be fine <clears throat> to feed individually. I wouldn't do open feeding. You can might get away with a little bit of open feeding pollen at this point of year. Lots of lots of folks do that, um, but it's not necessary for us here in, in Connecticut. You know, we have early pollen sources that sustain colonies and except for parts of the coast down along the shore, um, we rarely get into a pollen dearth here in Connecticut, but um, I guess you know that's again an individual thing. I, I don't, I don't, I never get a pollen dearth. I'm, I'm always seeing pollen come back um, uh, from right now until late October. Uh, for the for the new folks, if um, anyone does not know what open feeding is, please speak up and we can explain oh, okay. that. Open feeding. All right, so um, so open feeding is simply, you know, you put out uh, whatever it is, one-to-one -one, uh, um, sugar water out in a tub where bees can feed off of it or put it in a, a chicken water or something like that. And um, and the same thing with pollen, you put it in like a, they, they sell what looks like a little PVC tube and you can load that up with pollen and, and uh, plant that in a tree somewhere and bees will come and roll around in it and bring it back. Um, 
to the colony. As, as, I, as I say, you know, that's, and, and so that's what open feeding is. You're not feeding inside the colony itself. You're feeding in some central location. It is, it is, it is disastrous to do that during the dearth. You know, you will have bees all over you, the neighborhood, they'll sting your dog, you know, so just uh, don't do that during the dearth. Bad thing to do. <clears throat> That, now, this is just for backyard beekeepers, though. There, there are uh, larger operations will will do some of that, isn't that right? Uh, well, um, actually, larger operations here in Connecticut usually feed with, you know, a little hose and a uh, you know big tank, and a and a division board feeder. Inside the. I pound. personally don't like open feeding unless you got a uh, big yard with not a lot of people around. My biggest complaint about it is um, neighbor issues and drifting if you just move bees in there because you want to keep the barrels about, you know, 300, 400 feet away. Otherwise, they're going to be doing the round dance instead of the figure eight dance there, the waggle dance. And um, for those that don't know, circle dance doesn't tell them direction, just tells them distance. So then they're out or everything that smells like food. Versus if they do the waggle dance, they're going in a direction. Yeah. So, you know, so Bill's talking about drums. You you are not feeding out of drums. So <laughs> there's no reason for you to actually do open feeding in your colonies. Okay. All right. We got uh, some questions. We got yeah, we got some more. Um, I, I think I might have uh, missed part of the discussion here, but uh, Carol wants... Car Carol is saying, I did not know that you have to call the state inspector if you're going to eliminate a hive. The state inspector will give you a new queen? Uh, that was unusual. Um, I, I don't, uh, no, the, the state inspector will not give you a new queen unless you're Lauren. Who is luck, was lucky enough to get <laughs> that? That was just that was just the luck of my location, yeah, right? Like was, I was in Hamden, he was over there, and that that was just dumb luck. And at the uh, time, they had a, they had a queen rearing program going at at the Lockwood Farm, but that's not occurring now. So, yeah. So yeah. no, no. So the answer is no. The inspector will not give you a queen, right? So, um, so what's your best? What's your best suggestion for yellow jacket control? Kid, trap the queens in the spring. So start to look now. And well, not right now, but as soon as you first see uh, bumblebees out, uh, the bumblebee queens, they come out first. And they're, they're, you'll see them flying low to the ground. They're, they're flying all over the place. They're looking for old rodent burrows or some other... Uh, like little cavity underground or in a bird box or something like that uh, to, to start a new colony. So when those are out, shortly after that, you'll start to see yellow jackets that don't look so small. And those are the queen yellow jackets. They're, they have the same sort of interesting uh, colony uh, resurgence as bumblebees do. They're almost the same biology. They come out they overwinter as a single adults. They're they're pre-mated, and then they um, and then they come out and they start a new colony. Now uh, you can trap them. Uh, I use a lure for that that I that I buy, and um, I put I hang those out and I catch them. I catch queens by the by the you know dozens. It's not the nicest thing in the world to do, but what it'll do is it'll since they're pretty. Um, area specific, they don't have a large uh, flight zone. They're not like um, honeybees. They don't forage long, long distances. They stick around where they build their colonies. So you'll have less colonies right around you and you'll have less pressure from them all year long. Um, I found that to be a very effective way of controlling uh, those. Otherwise, you're gonna have to keep and maintain, make sure you don't, you have very strong colonies and that they keep, uh, they'll, they'll will do their own work at guarding against yellow jackets. They will not be able to get into a colony. I mean, they might sneak in and get a bite of something and then run back, but you're not gonna get overwhelmed by yellow jackets in a strong colony. They won't allow it. Yeah. The Bill, can you provide, uh, if, if you have it off the top of your head, the kind of lore that you use? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's called a um, yellow jacket uh, trap. And you can buy them from, you know, any of the supply houses, better be Man Lake. They all have them. And they're simple to, you, you, you mix, you mix up, they give you a little dry powder. 
and this thing that looks like, um, you know, it looks like an onion bulb, but it's fatter. And then you take the top off, you put their, you put their mixture in there, which is a combination of pheromone and some other uh, nasty smelling stuff. I usually add uh, a little piece of uh, sardine or something in it. Um, that will... Oh, for the protein that they want at this time of year. Well, it's the smell too that attracts them. And um, then they go into these little holes in the side of this um, trap and they, and, they, and they go down to the liquid. They can't get back out. Insects in general, if they have a cone entrance with the, with, the, with the big part out and they have to crawl through that cone to get to something, they can't get out. They can't figure out how to get back out. Bees, fish, lots of things are like that. They can only go in one way and come back out. And they can't come what back you, out. What are your thoughts on reversing boxes if you overwinter with two deeps? Well, I don't think you have to, but you can if you want to. Um, it, it may or may not slow down swarming. And you got to make sure you do it before there's brood between the two boxes. Because if you do it after that, so in your, so yeah, I'd be very cautious this year, especially. You might already have, especially in the center of the colonies where the queen's been laying out for a while, brood on the top frames and brood in a low circle down at the bottom where they finished out the entire, because some kind of queens will just lay in this um, football shaped um, pattern all over the top box and then a little bit on the bottom box. So now if you, if you reverse under those circumstances, you risk chilling that brood in the top box because you're gonna take a little patch of brood and where it was part of the cluster when it was naturally formed, if you flip it up to the top, there's a bunch of space between that little half round of brood up on the top now it's in the colder area it, it's, it's a warm area to spot but they have the bees go up there and take care of it at night now um so you're breaking that cluster up in an unnatural way and you can risk chilling brood so you have to be careful i you know if you want to if you want to reverse reverse early in the season and um, not that it would make any i don't think it makes much difference what bees will do is if you're going to run two boxes all the time bees will uh, do what they do naturally all of the time. They'll they'll start laying out uh, brood, and then when they'll the cells emerge in the top box, they'll either lay it out more, or they'll start backfilling with honey, or whatever. And the queen will be in a natural cycle between those two boxes. By the way, she can live in one box. She doesn't need to, but she'll be in a natural cycle between those two boxes where they'll push her down eventually and she'll come back up and you know so that's you can let it go that way and observe what happens you know but don't split the brood up that's my only caution so not uh, honeybee related but uh, maybe you could spend just a few seconds on this question someone has carpet uh carpenter bees in their house every year and they use the same tunnels so uh, they uh what do you suggest they do about that Enjoy them. I mean, they're they're a fantastic insect. I mean, they they're territorial. They they'll come after you uh, when you come down. They're not going to sting you or bite you, but they will just fly right in your face. It's it's an amazing thing to watch. Now they tunnel into the wood and ruin your uh, you ruin your <laughs> they ruin your trim in your house. So if you're not as enthused about like observing them as I am. You have to do something about um, the holes that they're they're building. There's really nothing you can do. Um, you can call an exterminator; he'll kill them, and that's uh, that's a, that's a tragedy because you really uh, do want them around. They're they're great pollinators, so you can coat that uh, wood with uh, some aluminum or do some other thing to discourage or put a barrier in it that will put hardware cloth over over the holes. You know, because what the problem isn't so much that they tunnel in. That is a problem, but they tunnel in and then woodpeckers um, can sense the brood inside there and they'll peck through whatever trim you have to get at the larva. All right, so that's, uh, you know, they're always a problem and I always get um, calls from folks, folks that want me to remove them, but I can't, you know, there's no way for me to do it. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, 
how much Doug is uh, uh, wants to ask his question here, because uh, I'm not sure what he's trying to get at, but uh, what are your thoughts on single deep brood boxes with queen excluders? Well, um, e e a single deep with a queen excluder and supers, honey supers above that will make you a nice harvest of honey, assuming that you can keep that bottom box from swarming. And the reason for that is because the queen doesn't really need more than about eight full frames of deeps to lay out at any time. By the time she's laid out all of those frames, even at um, you know 16 or 1800 eggs a day, the brood emerges in other frames before she can completely lay out eight frames of brood. And then she has room in, that, in those frames where the brood's emerging to lay out again. So a queen bee in uh, under normal circumstances only needs one box. And, but in that box will be mostly brood. And then on the sides, you might have a frame or two of honey. So what you'll find is you can put that queen excluder on. They have no other place to put their uh, stores, <clears throat> nectar stores. So they build, they build them out. They put them in, uh, in the supers above. Now, uh, this works great for withdrawn comb. If you have to get that colony to draw comb for you, it's a little different. Scenario is a little different, but... Um, so now you've forced them into a situation where they're putting all of their nectar into supers above that queen excluder. Now you also sometimes find that bees will lay out, will, will fill that bottom uh, super, the one closest to the queen excluder. They'll put pollen stores in there in some of those cells. You know, so that's really a uh, colony that's not, this is just behavioral, you know, not every colony does it. And it's, you have, you, if you find it, it's because you observed it, you know, so I'm not going to suggest to you that it occurs all the time. Sometimes it doesn't occur at all. So you have all of those um, boxes of honey above that single deep, which you've successfully kept from swarming, which is another thing you have to make sure you do. Um, you, you heard what Bill's technique is to let that uh, queen excluder out for a few days and let the queen get up there and lay out a little bit and then put that queen excluder out. First, you have to take the queen and put her back down below and um, let them lay out brood. That'll get them to work those supers a little sooner. But with drawn comb, I don't find that to be a problem though, because come up and put them all on there. Now you got a problem because you come along and it's uh, July or June and you're you know, the end of June or July and you're saying, okay, all my, my supers are full. What do I do with them? All right. So now you're, you're ending your, your, the dearth, the uh, flow is waning. There's some flow out there, but it's still waning. It's not the big flow that they use to uh, pack those supers full of honey. So if you take that off at that point, they don't have any stores and you have to make certain that you don't kill them at that point. Because you have a, if you, even if, if you kept a good robust colony down there and you've got nine seams of bees, lots of brood, the queen's still laying out. Um, they have no stores when you take them off. It's not like having a double deep where they've put in end frames of honey and, and crowns of honey over brood and all that stuff. You know, so they, you could end up in a situation where you kill your bees. You have to feed them back really quickly. You have to feed those bees. So double, so single deeps, queen excluder, and a couple of supers above it is the trend for honey makers and um, big, big honey producers are doing that. And um, but for backyard beekeepers, you could stay with your two boxes. If you want to try that, it'll work, but just make certain that you understand that once you crowd bees down into one box, that will tendency to swarm. And then um, and then once you take your soup, once you take your supers off, you gotta you gotta feed them. If especially if it's a big population of bees and you're going into the dearth, um, they'll adjust by dying. And that's a, that's kind of not the right not not the most um, I would just say humane way to be an animal husbandry person like we are. Another question about queen excluders. Can I use two, one on the top and one on the bottom? What would you want to do that for? One on Bill, the top. Wanna, yeah, Bill, you want to speak up? Yeah, for swarming. So if there's one on the bottom, they can't force the queen out. And if there's one on the top, they can't put pollen and Put brood up in the in the honey. How about with, with a single box, with a single or a double. Well, he's, he's uh, talking about preventing that queen from flying out from swarming. Yeah, like yeah. 
things at once, I guess. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so the queen can't, the, the normal situation, if you put a queen excluder on the bottom of a colony that is, um, that has the swarm urge, right? Uh, so what will occur? Well, the queen won't be able to get out. So the colony won't be able to swarm, but that won't stop the swarm impulse. <laughs> to tell you the truth, that won't, um, I've never actually done that. So I don't actually know what would happen, but I'll tell you, I, uh, you have a couple of things that are really, really problematic about that. First of all, your drones will die in the colony on top of the queen excluder. You're wow. going to kill a lot of drones because they can't get out anyway at that point, right? Because they're trapped in there. And uh, lots of folks see that when they put uh, drone brood above a queen excluder in the configuration that Bill was talking about earlier uh, with that demary or demary um, manipulation that he was talking about where you fly your top colony out of a, a second box. So you can see you'll kill your, your drones. They'll be dead. Um, the queen will uh, is essentially um, not ready for mate, not ready for laying. So she's going to, if you successfully be, I don't really see if this is a strange question because it's, I've never done it. I, and I can't figure the biology out um, right away, except that they have raced the queen around below and stopped her from laying brood. Um, hey, Bill? Yeah. Um, if, Have you ever done that, Michael? No, but if the queen can't get out when she's ready to swarm, one of her daughters will probably take her out and then she won't be able to make because she can't get out either. It yeah. sounds like a death wish. Yeah, it, 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 sounds like it'll, it sounds like it'll kill the colony. <laughs> so eventually it would kill the colony, but I don't really know. Bill, you got any, anything to say about that? Um, the, that's right. The virgin will hatch out and she will queen, kill the, um, the original Maybe. mother. Yeah, I mean, that's, um, that could happen. That's most likely what will happen. Yeah. The virgin could get out between the queen excluder and come back. And by the time she's, um, she's fattened up there when her... Um, ovaries are uh, enlarged she'll uh, she'll be trapped in there again but i don't like that idea i think it's better just to tilt your colony and see is there queen cells under there and if you see right. one there's more and then yeah. go from there yeah that i but but it's an interesting question but it will not work um so a queen excluder works on the size of the bee's thorax so a brand new emerged you know a enclosed queen a virgin has the thorax the same size as an adult queen. So they don't grow. So it's rare, but a virgin can sometimes squeeze through a queen excluder. I've seen it happen. I mean, my queen excluders that allow queens through, I have them marked, you know, uh, you know that they're, they're effective and I use them for skunk control. But, um, but they, uh, you know, so, so yeah, so she wouldn't, if she did get out and fly when she came back, she wouldn't. Walter. Thank you. So I actually worked with a beekeeper in Iowa who did this as a general practice. And what um, happened? The colonies did not die, but they were not strong producers. Um, he liked it because th there wouldn't be many drones. What was happening is the bees were forced to clean up the dead drones is what would happen. Um, but the reason I was called to his apiary is there was a swarm in a tree and he was he didn't know how that was possible. Um, with some careful inspection, we found out that the, the swarm did not have a queen with it. And the swarm went back into the hive. Well, um, yeah. So at least in that one example, I can tell you the bees still swarmed, but when the queen was not with them, they returned. They went to their first spot where they gathered. Then they went back into the hive, yeah. um, not long after. Well, I mean, and that happens. That happens when the queen leaves, also. You know, yeah. so, so sometimes the queen, you know, leaves and falls down in the front of the colony or something, or um, or they leave and they and the queen didn't follow them. So yeah. I, I love, I, I mean, I've seen that a number of times, maybe 12 times. And um, I just love seeing that. I mean, they leave the colony, they go and bivouac, and then you lost them and then they come back and it's like, wow, you know, thank you. You know, they come right back into the same colony. Yeah, um, yeah usually in that situation, um, you know, you'll find, uh, you know, you can find a lot of interesting scenarios. So he did that regularly. Yeah, that was his general practice. His hives were not strong producers, but they did not die out. 
Um, so it's possible, but I get for all the reasons you outlined, it's not a good idea. It's not a good idea. And um, they can't, the, when they, when the queens, when drones die in a colony above a queen excluder and they have no other way out, what occurs is the bees will be able to extract their body from below. They pull it through, but their head pops off. So if you ever see a queen excluder with a lot of little rolling heads on it, it's, uh, it's because drones died on, in, um, in that process. Okay, let's talk about splits. Which do you recommend? Walk away, do little, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I don't have a recommendation. You know, um, you, what, you make a split based on um, how you want to do it. So you can perform a walk away. You can, uh, and a walk away split has the longest interval for the <clears throat> queenless part of that split to get queen right, because it has to go from emergency cells, unless of course you did a walk away split during um, swarm season and you had swarm cells, you know, then it would be fine. So walk away split takes the longest. You can requeen a split, you know, you can do lots of other things um, to make it, um, so, so I got a little pamphlet out that you can actually purchase, but you don't have to. The next time I see, I'll give you one. Or the next time we have a meeting, I'll bring a bunch of them, which explains all the different kinds of splits and how they operate. And so that's the, the first thing to do is get familiar with the biology of each kind of split, like a walkaway split or where you requeen it and how you how you make a walkaway split work and you know um, and so on and so forth. But you know the way I like to make splits, if I can is um, use a mated queen. It gets, gets the colony up and running the fastest, in, in my opinion. So, um, <clears throat> but there's lots of ways to make a split. So I don't really have a recommendation, but I do encourage you to read about how splits work. Um, and um, there's plenty of good literature out there talking about those. And uh, you, could, um, you could certainly um, find lots of reading material to get you on board on um, those different options. Uh, next question, first year coming up. What if I don't harvest the honey so bees can eat it all winter? You're lucky if you make honey in the first year. That's, that's you know, so that's, uh, you know, so it's not, it's not uncommon to make honey in the first year, but it, at the same time, your job as a beekeeper in year one is to get your colonies up and fed well in the, in the fall, keep them, um, uh, pathogen, keep the pathogen load down by making certain that your colony is clean of uh, varroa during the year, and then bring healthy bees into October, feed them well, and uh, if you have to, if there's not a good October flow, with goldenrod or not wheat or something like that, and then um, overwinter them, and then in the second year is when you plan on making your honey. But you can make honey from packages in year one, and it has happened many times here in Connecticut, people got packages and their, their colonies swarmed. It built so fast. You can count on a package getting up to strength in about 10 weeks being at a full strength. So figure out if you're, if you're gonna be, uh, if you're gonna be wanting to make honey, you usually miss the flow with the, cause the bees are actually building you know, their populations, because 10 weeks is a long time. And if you get one, say, in April, let's say you get your package the first week in April, you've got all April, May, and half of June before that colony is up to strength. And that means, and that's assuming that everything is right. And um, so you're right on the end part of our flow. You know, so our main flow, where you'll make a lot of honey. Uh, so a nuke, on the other hand, might take about eight weeks to get up to uh, speed. So if you had a nuke and you, everything went correctly and the bees were healthy and they might build in eight weeks, you might catch the end of the May flow. If you got an early nuke somewhere, I don't know where, but if you got an early nuke, um, uh, you could get, because uh, they usually come later. So they, they, they take longer to build, but they don't come until a couple of weeks after packages. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> so anyway. So that's, that's why it's hard to make honey the first year. You're you're building you're building the colony for strength. Can I can I jump in for just a sec? Just because sure. as, a first, as a first year person, Bill doesn't okay. mean that your your bees aren't going to make any honey. 
you're going to have one or two brood boxes and they're going to make honey in there. That's for them. That's not for you. Yes, yes. You're talking about honey that like you put another box on there that's for you. So they're going to make honey and that's for them. And you can't have that. Okay. That's not for you. That's <laughs> like, he's talking about the third box. It doesn't mean that the, the, the bees like magically take 12 months to start producing honey. It's not no, like okay, a great. Or thank, asparagus or something. Yeah. Thank you for, thank you for, uh, for clarifying that Dean. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> or for paraphrasing me in the way that I was explaining. Yeah. So we're talking about um, what we call um, excess stores or excess honey. Is there a way to trick the hive into thinking that they swarmed? Yes, there's lots of ways to do that. You know, one is, um, you know, well, trick them and trick it by, by tricking them. You're going to, um, the only way you can actually trick them is knock down the swarm urge and continue to do that. Keep knocking down swarm cells until they lose the urge. Now you heard Kavita earlier making her comb honey and she did exactly that, right? She had to go back every couple of days, five days. And she went back and she um, excised um, uh, swarm cells out of those boxes because they continued and continued to have the urge to swarm or they might've even, you know, until, until they run out of um, all of the uh, correct age larva, she's, um, um, <clears throat> they will, they will eventually stop swarming. Now you can, there's, there's some really interesting uh, ways to shake boxes out on the ground. One is a uh, technique uh, anytime, by the way, you, the other way to actually, that's what I was talking to you about swarm prevention, to trick a colony to thinking that it actually swarmed. Um, <clears throat> Bill's earlier explanation of how he manipulates the colony by splitting the brood and putting them on that, that's one way to, they think they swarmed and sometimes the swarm ridge goes away. The, uh, the other one is, is a, um, I always pronounce this wrong. Maybe somebody can, maybe you can look this up, Dean. It's, um, uh, I, to Taz, Tazanoff's uh, swarm method. Who can, who knows that actual name? Tarnoff, you mean? Yes, 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 Tarnoff, yeah. So that is a great way to trick your bees into uh, thinking they swarmed. So somebody want, if somebody wants to try that this year, I'll send my film crew up. <laughs> To observe you shaking your bees out on a cloth in front of your colony on an inclined ramp. So under those circumstances, you shake all the bees out of the colony onto a um, sheet that's that has a um, incline an inclined plane that's pointing toward the entrance of the colony, and uh, you shake them all out. And what happens is they uh, they they walk back in, and the queen doesn't usually find her way into the colony because she can't fly. So she walks to the end of that ramp and goes underneath usually and a little a globe of bees forms around her and the rest of the colony goes in and that and then they think they've swarmed. So you, you recover that, that, that queen and um, put her in another box. The colony that has all the resources. Let's see if we can uh, maybe get to some of these last few questions before right. our <laughs> time expires. So a question a for minutes. both both bills, what do you prefer, metal or, or plastic queen excluders? Well, I uh, I don't use, I use metal ones with a wood frame. I don't use plastic because I don't have to. You know, I have, I have uh, tons of queen excluders that I bought back in the day and I just keep them. Um, I like the fact that they have a little space between the boxes. You can see that they're in there with a plastic queen excluder. You, you, a, lot, a lot of times you can't remember if that colony has a queen excluder in it, you know, but you can see the wooden ones, they're there. The wooden ones require work. Uh, you have to clean them. The same thing happens with uh, plastic ones. Um, they, they get, uh, they build wax up and or sometimes they build propolis on them. So, so I don't have a, I don't think there's a preference, but I, I, I use the wooden ones. I mean, they're more, way more expensive than the plastic ones. So if you had a, a lot to purchase, I guess you would purchase the plastic ones. Now, uh, how much of an issue is it when you're clean, cleaning those metal ones that you're actually going to bend uh, some of that metal and allow a larger space that the queen can walk through? Yeah, uh, um, yeah, you, you don't you don't use a lot of force. I don't use any force at all when I clean them. I use them. I put them in my solar melter. 
So it melts them out, it melts the wax off of them. Melts a lot of stuff, melts the propolis, melts the wax out of them. They come out pretty clean. If you get them while they're hot out of that melter, you can just put it, use a cloth and finish them off. You don't have to get them perfectly clean. You just want to make certain that um, bees can get through them with little or no work. Now bees will clean off spots on them that they that they have if they have to to get up to those those colonies. But yeah, they're they're easy yeah. enough. The other way you can do it is with a hair dryer. I have a commercial heat gun. I also use, I built this little box that I put my queen excluder over the top of. And I use this, um, you know, um, heat gun and it melts it immediately. And it, and actually it's, since it's putting out a jet stream of hot air, it pushes the honey droplets off the frames, uh, off the bars. So it's really nice. So I never really touched the bars. When are we going to begin in-person meetings? Um, so we are gonna have, uh, in-person meeting, you have to look at the event page. Uh, I can't remember exactly the date of it, but we will have two sessions this year that are in-person. And then um, we're probably going to ramp that up for next year um, and have more. But we are starting this year at the Ag Center with personal meetings. But remember, whenever we have a personal meeting, we exclude lots of people who come and have joined our club from other areas in the country. There's folks on here tonight from that belong to California bee clubs. And there's usually people from Florida. There's people from Georgia on here. So we have to make certain that we're, that we're conscious of uh, not excluding a bunch of membership um, that has joined our clubs. That's the way clubs have gone in the last uh, year during the pandemic when we couldn't meet. Um, our, our membership has become way more diverse and way more, way more um, geographically spread out. So um, to do an in-person meeting, we have to, I think also, we're also obligated to, to also provide a Zoom link on that same meeting. So but, um, be careful with that. <clears throat> does anyone have experience using Better Bee Comb, thinking about using uh, them to give my package bees a kickstart? I think she's, I think she's talking about the pre-made comb, right? Is that right? I think so, but that's all she wrote. Carol, would you like to expand on your question? Yes, I'm talking about the pre-made comb, yep. Yeah, well that's, um, are you talking about, is it 100% beeswax or are you talking about the- um, It's not It's not beeswax, it's wax, but it's not yeah, beeswax. It's, it's paraffin. Yeah. But, yeah. 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 Yeah, I don't know, try it. I, I, I would, I, I'm not in favor of paraffin over natural wax because it it acts differently in the way that it's um um it's it's absorption of uh um oils and water are different you know mm -hmm. so paraffin and beeswax don't work the same way and i'm not sure how paraffin would stand up to lots of excessive heat or cold so i don't really know those answers i haven't run paraffin frames yeah, I I there's a there's a company that's making beeswax comb, but I'm not sure if that's available commercially. But if you're going to buy that, Carol, you have to buy it soon because they don't ship that in the in the in the warmer weather. No, I already bought it. Oh, I, already, okay. I just wanted to know if anybody had experience with it, and uh, I just you know I want to try it. But I agree with you about the type of wax, but um, I thought I would try it. Um, yeah, try it. I mean, well, you know, in, you know, bees, you know, bees are pretty adaptive. They're going to line the inside cell. When right. Using the brood box, what will happen is they're going to, they're gonna, if they successfully raise brood in, brood in it, and I'm sure they do. Um, um, I'd be cautious about the paraffin source also, who knows where it comes from. But um, remember, the first brood that goes in there leaves behind a cocoon, which the bees try to clean out, but don't successfully get all of it out. So there's some residue that's always left back. So there, there's kind of a barrier that's built inside of the cell. And then also there's a propolis lining that goes into certain parts of the cell. Mm -hmm. so, um, you know, so the bees take care to make certain that that envelope inside that cell is appropriate for rearing uh, brood. So let us know what happens. Yeah, thanks. Though we are we are getting short on time, but uh, before We're I go to the last question, uh, Lynn Russo is from San Francisco. So thank you for joining us from San Francisco, Lynn. Uh, and 
the uh, indications for when to add honey supers to overwintered hives. Now I would say you do it on the early, the first sign of any dandelions that pop up anywhere around you, just put them on. You know, the earlier, the better. Um, it doesn't hurt to put on supers early, especially, well, if you're planning on getting them drawn, you know, if you're going with foundation, then that's a different story. But if you have drawn comb, put it on early. That's the end of our question. So uh, yeah, we have to wrap it up. Look, I, I want you to, I want to um, roll back to this wonderful gift that you gave us. Oh my gosh. Um, um, we really appreciate it, um, Jose and I, and um, very much. And uh, so we'd like to make certain that you pay attention to our event schedule. If you're not a member of uh, CBA and you're on this call, I should have. I, I meant to say this earlier. Please consider joining. Um, your membership fees are 100% used for the club. No one in the club is associated with any kind of um, uh, business that uh, that they uh, that they that we use funds for or any other way. Um, everything goes into website management and and the bee yard and all of that. So uh, it's all for you. And also we have a wonderful lineup of guest speakers. We have coming up right now next week is Heather Matilla. You should make certain you see that. She's going to talk about giant hornets and you can ask her her question about headless bees because there's plenty of them. And that I've seen those hornets uh, work uh, bee colonies in Thailand. And, um, uh, and I've seen uh, wasps and yellow jackets in Africa. So, um, so it's a different scenario when you see the real thing. You know, but we, um, she's going to talk about those. And she's going to talk about um, some other things. She's a great speaker. She's a wonderful scientist. And she's been around for a long time. She's the real deal. She's also a beekeeper. So um, make sure you see her. We have a wonderful mentor program that's running really well, thanks to Jose. And I think um, we've got all of our matches made so far this year. And uh, I think that's about it. If you think of anything else, our first bee yard event is March 25th. We're expecting of packages from Bill and um, and uh, hopefully we're hoping the 25th works out because that would mean that or the 24th the packages come I think um, and uh, then we'll have those packages for our first workshop on the next day and then we'll install those packages at the BR look up our location at the BR it's it's in we call it the Boulder No the CBA Boulder No B yard because that's a geographical area of Cheshire easy to find. Um, and uh, we hope to see you there. All right.